In this video, we'll discuss some of the features of connectionist networks that are often said to set them apart from classical symbolic models. This include parallel processing and distributor representations, as well as the ensuing properties of graceful degradation and fault tolerance. Let's start with the connectionist style of computation. Traditionally, digital computers are serial processors since they perform one computation at a time. The result of a particular computation can then serve as the input to a second computation, and this is the starting point for another computation and so on. Thus, if you see it as a physical symbol system, a traditional computer will take individual symbols or strings of symbols as inputs, and then apply a set of algorithms, and then produces more symbols, again, or, or, or symbol structures at its output. Now, these steps are performed one at a time, but really, really quickly by a central processor. So, classical computer beings have, are typically uh, uh, characterized as being uh, digital rather than analog and serial rather than parallel, and uh, as having architectures that emphasize the obligation of rules to symbols. Now, as we saw, connectionists see themselves as providing an alternative to classical computation. In other videos, we have talked about rules and symbols and about the digital analog distinction, but we haven't mentioned the serial parallel divide. The opposite of serial processing is parallel processing, and indeed, the brain seems to resemble more a parallel device than a serial one. The brain, unlike a classical computer, does not contain a central processing unit or CPU, which is very fast and precise and works in a sequential manner. Instead, the brain has billions of individually slow and relatively sloppy processors working together at any time. And these are the, the neurons, of course. So neurons may be dumb and sloppy, but they succeed because of their connections. They're a bit like some politicians, perhaps. Of course, there are computers nowadays that have several processors that operate concurrently, and they implement parallel processing. However, what sets the brain and brain-inspired architectures apart is that the processing can really get really get massively parallel. Okay, now to connection is representation. Another signature issue is the way in which connectionist models handle representations. In a classical system that represents the concept of a dog, for instance, there may be a single symbol that has the job of standing for dogs. Some neural, neural networks work like this too. For instance, there might be one node that is in charge of representing dogs, another one in charge of representing cats, and yet another one that does the job for mice. This is what is called a localized representational scheme. In localized representation, individual nodes are symbols. So each unit stands for a concept or individual or whatever it is that is being represented. And each relevant concept is represented by a unit. So this just means that units are meant to fire always and only when presented with instances of what they are supposed to represent. So here we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the relevant nodes and what is being represented by them. However, this is not typical of connectionist networks, since they often instantiate distributed representations. In a distributed representation scheme, meaning is not captured by a single symbolic unit, but by patterns of activity over a collection of neurons. In such schemes, each concept is represented by a pattern of activity in which more than one neuron takes part. So each unit can participate in the representation of more than one concept. So it might be that all of the units in a layer participate in the representation of all concepts, so that the, the, the job is shared among all the nodes. So for a comparison, in a locally scheme, we might have a, a layer of units who, which are in charge of representing vowels. So in this network, for instance, the first unit fires always and only when it is shown uh, the letter A, whereas the second unit fires only when E is present. The third unit represents I. So each of these units represents, uh, um, represents a distinct, it's a symbol, right? Symbolizes or represents a, 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 a given vowel. Now, in a distributed, in a distributed scheme, on the other hand, um, A might be instantiated, for example, uh, when units 3 and 5 have an activation of 1, and units 1 and 2 and 4 have an activation of 0 0.5. And it may be that E is coded by an activation of, uh, of 1 right in unit 2, while unit 4 has an activation of 0 0.5, and the rest are at 0. And suppose that I is instantiated when 2 and 5 are at 1, 3 is at 0 0.75, 4 at 0 0.5, and 1 at 0, and so forth. So the important thing to see here is that all units 
are in charge of representing all vowels. So there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between units and concepts coded. Rather, there's a lot of overlap. So what represents a given letter is not a given unit, but a pattern of activation across a whole set of units. Again, which are also recruited in the representation of other letters. In short, connection networks typically contain distributor representations. In a distributed representation, one cannot always interpret the meaning of a single unit in isolation. I mean, sometimes you can. For instance, here you can see that although no single unit represents the letter A or the letter Z, the first unit clearly fires in the presence of horizontal lines right? and represents perhaps horizontal lines, and the second unit codes for the absence of vertical lines and so, so on and so forth. But sometimes, especially with hidden units in which the coding has not yet has not said by the trainer but has been arrived at by the machine after a learning process, it's not clear what each unit is coding for. Indeed, it might be hard to see them as symbols at all. Researcher Paul Smolensky, in an important paper in 1989, said that perhaps the most fundamental contrast between the classical and connectionist paradigms has to do with the semantic interpretation of the formal models. He says that the classical paradigm is symbolic, but that the connectionist uh, paradigm is sub-symbolic. This means that in a symbolic paradigm, like the classical one, uh, you have symbols that denote semantically interpretable entities, such as a cat or a chair. And at the same time, they are the objects of formal manipulation. Right? Remember how, in, in Hoagland's view, the tokens lead syntactic and semantic lives at the same time. They were objects of computation, but objects of interpretation. And so here, this is the expression of that. The unit of interpretation is, is the same as the unit of computation. But that's not necessarily the case in uh, connectionist units. What is semantically interpretable is not the units themselves, but patterns of activations of our large units in the system. But the entities manipulated by the rules are the individual activation of units by means of the activation rules, right? And so the sort of entities that are uh, uh, formally manipulated, so to speak, is not the same as the ones that are semantically interpretable. So again, in the symbolic paradigm, it's the symbols, so the symbols are not semantically interpretable entities, and they're also the objects of rule-based formal interpretation. They live the same thing, thus has a semantic and a syntactic life. But in the sub-symbolic paradigm, what is semantically interpretable are patterns of activation. And what is the object of rules, in this case, um, general rules, right, common to all networks, such as the input rule or the activation rule or the back propagation rule, are, are the individual activations of the objects of rules, right? Are, are the individual units. And so just to, to, to put it like more concisely then, in the symbolic classical paradigm, the symbols or tokens are both the units of interpretation and the units of computation. But things come apart in the sub-symbolic paradigm, right? In that the units of interpretation are not individual uh, uh, units, but patterns of activation over groups of units. And the units of computation are the individual units' activations. Now, here, wait a moment, let's do a digression. So, connectionists make a lot of emphasis on the brain employing distributor representation. However, according to neuroscientist Christoph uh, uh, Koch, for, he says that for things that you see over and over again, like your family, your boyfriend, or celebrities, your brain may have uh, neurons that wire up and fire very specifically to them. He says these neurons are very, very specific, much more than people think. Indeed, a 2005 study in which uh, Koch participated has surprising results and made the rounds in the media. So the research team took eight patients undergoing treatment for epilepsy in an attempt to locate the brain areas responsible for the seizures. Each patient had around 100 tiny electrodes implanted in their brain. Many of the wires were played in the hippocampus, an area of the brain which is vital to long-term memory formation. Well, the researchers found that, th that in one subject there was a long neuron that responded selectively to pictures of Jennifer Aniston, who used to be in the show Friends. I don't know if you remember it. I certainly never watched it. Well, they call this cell the Jennifer Aniston neuron. And, uh, and another subject had neurons that responded selectively to pictures of Halle Berry, and another one to each of the Beatles. Well, of course, these results have to be taken with a grain of salt, and they have been very sensationalized. Still, 
I shuddered at the thought that there might be a Justin Bieber neuron lurking at the depths of my brain, ready to fire when I least suspect it. Okay, let's change the gears. One of the main complaints against classical computational models is that they are brittle. This is evidence in what is called sharp degradation, which uh, is basically that the removal or malfunction of part of the system will result in a clear crash, a degradation of performance. So, for instance, if you remove a, a, a symbol token or this starts to malfunction, um, so there will be a loss of the information that was stored in that token, right? An all or nothing matter. And likewise, if you lose an operating procedure, you know, this, the process that was affected by that procedure will no longer be usable. And so, all in all, then <laughs> there is a fall in a performance that is sudden and clearly defined. On the other hand, thanks to parallel processing and distributed representation, connectionist uh, uh, networks are said to exhibit what is called graceful degradation and fault tolerance, in that they are more robust to damage than uh, local representations, such as symbolic ones. In a connectionist system, performance does not fall sharply with either damage to the system or erroneous inputs. Instead, the performance will decline gradually. For instance, in a classical system, according to connectionist, if your symbol for dog is damaged, you pass from a normal state in which you're able to represent dogs perfectly well to a catastrophic one in which you can't represent dogs at all. This would be especially bad for those classical systems that are dog owners. However, in a connectionist system, even if one or two units involved in the representation of dogs are damaged, the rest of the units will be, will be able to pick up some of the slack. And so, even if the system becomes more error-prone, it is still able to function. Connectionists say that, in this respect, human minds resemble connectionist networks more than classical systems, since bearing injury or misfortune, our cognitive abilities decline steadily as we age, and we become slower and make more mistakes. So they take this as a reason for choosing connectionist models as because they're more, more faithful to facts of our biological minds, right? Or so is claimed. Connectionist models are also said to exhibit fault tolerance, right? They, they, they still function relatively error-free when the system has damage to its connections or units or when the input uh, stimuli are incomplete. So even when part of a stimulus has been obscured, the rest of the connection waves may be strong enough to elicit the correct response. So, look, for instance, in this case, you have no problem, right, uh, uh, recognizing the word make, even though there's the K is, has been obscured. So this is why neural networks are good at pattern completion and do a good job at pattern recognition under noisy circumstances. And so are you, say connectionists. Just think of the CAPTCHA task. You may despise it, but you're relatively good at it. Well, some people are better than others. Anyway. Okay, this is all for this video. Cheers. Cheers.